क्या लाइक प्रिया लाइक गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग टू दिस लेक्चर विद डॉक्टर सुष्मिता कौशिक मैम Uh, thank you, ma'am, for taking out your time and uh, uh, delivering this lecture. Uh, I request Dr. Vanita, ma'am, to introduce Dr. Sushmita, ma'am. Ma'am, you're on mute, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rolika, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sushmita Kaushik to our uh, audience today. um she uh, completed her mbbs uh, at delhi university and uh, she did her ms at delhi as well um ma'am see if i'm not mistaken molana molana azad and she joined pgi in 2004 and uh, she has been associated with them since uh, she's now a full professor as i just told you um well she you know she's published widely she's presented widely national international fora she has several awards for uh, best presentations especially uh in the north circuit i was seeing uh, how many she listed out very very difficult to name them all but uh, no she has not only published widely she has written numerous book chapters i think in excess of 30 she has been a former secretary of the uh, glaucoma society of india and the founder secretary of the uh, indian pediatric glaucoma society uh, one of her interests of course is childhood glaucoma amongst the several that she has and team cfs now requests her to deliver her lecture on other developmental childhood glaucomas we've already had primary congenital glaucoma as you all know with dr mandal last last lecture Sushmita. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Vanita. It's it's a pleasure. I'll just share my slides. Uh, they're visible. Yeah, the slides are on. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Oh, just go on to the um, slide. Right. Yeah. So um, right. at the outset, thank you so much. Uh, I focus is a great platform, and I thank Dr. Santosh. And it's great to have Dr. Harsh, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Vanita, all 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 good friends. so uh, it's my pleasure to really follow up with the, the guru of childhood glaucoma uh, dr mandal and since we've just heard about primary congenital glaucoma we'll go on to the non primary but yet to developmental glaucomas and uh, associated abnormalities so um, in the next uh, maybe half hour or so what we talk about is who has childhood glaucoma how do we know Uh, i wish all babies would raise their hand and say i have childhood glaucoma but that doesn't happen um how does the angle develop it's important to know that because the underlying cause of all uh, infantile glaucomas at least is a developmental anomaly and how do we recognize angle dysgenesis once we say it is there how do we recognize what why does it happen how early can glaucoma develop what options do we have for management and then what next so um, who has childhood glaucoma we have to thank something called and we'll keep talking about this this is the childhood glaucoma research network it's an umbrella network of uh, clinicians of allied medical professionals all concerned with the management and the follow up of children with glaucoma and uh, in the last decade or so i would say the cdrn has taken the lead and pushed the world glaucoma association to take note of the fact that a sizable number of children have glaucoma which require focused attention so this consensus series 9 came out with guidelines and uh, and consensus as to who do you say has childhood glaucoma and how do you classify them so that what we are talking here and somebody is talking in japan and somebody in the us are all talking the same thing so briefly intraocular pressure related damage to the eye and that is seen with at least two of the following criteria you need to have an intraocular pressure more than 21 now this is of course investigator discretion required for children examined under anesthesia because there are variable effects of anesthesia and ifp measurement and because there are so many different agents used there's not a number to it but by and large most people uh, take 16 as a magic number for very small children with glaucoma optic disc changes if you have a cupping or progressive increase or a cup to disc ratio of more than 0.2 now remember in children there's hardly any cup 
So for a small baby, anything in excess of 0.3 is very, very suspicious. Corneal findings, Harb's try, of course, the Desmet's defect, which scrolls on itself, and a diameter, which is more than 11 in the newborn, 12 at less than one year, or more than 13 at any age. A progressive myopia, which means a myopic shift or an increase in axial length beyond the normal growth. And a reproducible visual field defect, which is consistent with a glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And these are, of course, for older children. Now, these are young children in our clinic. And you can see that you can, you can do a lot with them. So you don't have to bother too much and uh, brush them away saying, Bacha dikhaiga ne, or, or you can't examine them. You do. So this, this little fellow must be about three years old. This is also two and a half. And she's allowing a gonioscopy. And this is applanation tonometry. And, and these children, really, when you make friends with them, you realize that you do most things and you don't require anesthesia except when they're very, very small. But remember, childhood glaucoma is like an ocean. It's similar on the surface, but it has countless myriad hues within. And one size doesn't fit all, especially with this group of children. So now that you've diagnosed childhood glaucoma, what next? So remember I told you about the CGRN network. So developmental glaucoma, we are going to divide as the CGRN has classified it. And it really makes it very, very easy. And we'll see how. So we finished with primary childhood glaucomas, which is PCG, which actually means there's an isolated angle dysgenesis with nothing else. Nothing else in the eye, nothing else systemically, just an isolated angle abnormality. And that is what primary congenital glaucoma is. You could have a neonatal onset, which is less than one month, infantile, which is one to 24 months, late onset or late recognized if the child comes after two years. And of course, beyond that, beyond three years is generally termed juvenile glaucoma. So here is the primary, which is out of the way. Today, what we're going to talk about is the secondary childhood glaucomas, which are non-acquired. So you have two big, big uh, uh, groups. You have a non-acquired and an acquired glaucoma. So the acquired glaucomas are easy, all your trauma, steroid, surgery, etc. And one entire group being given to glaucoma following cataract surgery, because cataract surgery in children is easily the most important acquired condition that we need to take care of. So then this leaves us with a secondary childhood glaucoma, which is not acquired, so it's developmental. And yet one is with a non-acquired ocular anomaly. The other is a non-acquired systemic anomaly. And this is the yellow bit which we're going to talk about today. So glaucoma associated with ocular anomalies in addition to angle dysgenesis. So all childhood glaucomas or infantile glaucomas have angle dysgenesis. And if you have ocular anomalies in addition to that, it falls into this group. Axenfeld, Peters, ectropion uva, congenital hypoplasia, aniridia, PHPB, mitrophthalmos, mitrocornea, ectopia lentis. These are the broad groups, but any other ocular anomaly or mixtures of these would fall into this. Whereas the other one, easily the commonest is Sturge Weber, but we also see homocystinurias, mucopolysaccharidosis, Axenfeld Rieger syndrome with systemic anomalies. And also, I'm happy that we pushed in congenital rubella syndrome here as well. And we'll talk about why we say it is non-acquired, though it is a viral infection. So the next question is, what is angle dysgenesis? We've, already, we've said that it is associated with angle dysgenesis, but then what is it? So for that, we need to know what a normal infantile angle is. So when you have a small baby, this is the usual setup for, for a goniotomy or for doing a direct gonioscopy. So this is what a direct gonioscope, this is a small Jacob lens. And this is a baby with the head tilted a little bit and gently it's put on the cornea and then you see it through the microscope. So this is what a normal angle should look like. So I, I would uh, urge you all when you're doing a cataract surgery or you're doing any other squint surgery, any other procedure, just put in a gonioscope just to get a feel of what a normal angle would look like so that it's easy for you to then discover or, or diagnose that this genesis is at all. So it's a flat iris insertion. The ciliary band is generally present. You can see this here. The stroma is not very well defined because it keeps developing. You can see the major arterial circle of the iris and you can see radial vascular pillar. So this is what a normal uh, infantile angle should look like. A bit about the development at five months, so still about five months, there's no, no sign of the angle. A continuous layer of endothelium covers it. 
and the iris inserts just in front of the primordial trabecular meshwork. So this is the future trabecular meshwork. And you can see that the iris has started coming on it. And then by the third trimester, this endothelial layer progressively disappears and the peripheral uveal tissue begins to slide posteriorly. So when you say that the iris has not receded back, this is exactly what that means. That if it's maldeveloped, you'll have a high insertion, which means the iris is inserted high into the trabecular meshwork and it hasn't gone back, which is why the trabecular meshwork is not open to the aqueous, which is why it damps and which is why the pressure rises, right? So then uh, the development of trabecular lamellae happen and intertrabecular spaces continues to form. But remember, this development continues till about one year of age and the normal anterior chamber angle continues to develop. So I'll just put in a caveat of why it is now known very well that if you do a cataract surgery or you do a PPB or anything in a child less than six months or eight months, it's the smaller children who land up with glaucoma simply because you're fiddling with a non-developed trabecular meshwork. So you don't have a trabecular meshwork which is developed, you don't have a drainage, and yet you've gone and given an acquired condition to it. So lesser age is the most important risk factor for developing glaucoma in children after any surgery. So that's, that's one point to understand why that happens. But it's not enough to have trabecular meshwork developing, you need to have an outflow channel, right? So this, Outflow channel, the collagen fibers start at about 12 weeks. It connects with the Schlems canal at about 26 weeks. Then the longitudinal fibers expand, the pores develop by 40 weeks. So you can have a preterm glaucoma whose angle has simply not developed. And then the development of episcleral venous plexus occurs two months afterward. So now again, the practical thing of this is if we know that, you'll understand why angle surgery or goniotomy is so successful between 2 and 12, 24 months of age, and not so successful in less than that, because if you're just incising the trabecular meshwork and the outflow channels have not formed, your pressures are not going to go down. So that's another caveat of understanding what is happening. So coming to understanding that, what does a pathological angle in developmental glaucoma look like? So Sam Paulus has written a wonderful book of pediatric glaucoma, which is our Bible, really. And he's the one who has told us that there is a type one and a type two angle because he did hundreds and hundreds of goniotomies and wondered why some worked and some did not. And then he went back and saw his drawings. And from his drawings, he figured out that those in whom the goniotomy worked had a type one angle where the trabecular meshwork was visible and that was amenable to surgery. Whereas this type two angle, you can see the iris has not receded at all. So if it's covering the trabecular meshwork, it's easy to understand why a goniotomy is like, unlikely to work in this. So what is anterior segment dysgenesis? Now, this entire umbrella is a group of non-acquired ocular anomalies, which have developmental abnormalities of the anterior segment and the entire anterior segment. Many genes are responsible. The genes that are responsible for development of the ciliary body, lens, iris, and cornea are going to be responsible for developmental abnormalities as well. So therefore, they affect multiple structures and the clinical classification and description of each sometimes becomes difficult. But typically, I would like you all to remember that anterior segment dysgenesis include combinations of lots of congenital abnormalities and you need to recognize them and put them together as a puzzle and then find out what a phenotype is. So you would have iris hypoplasia, ectopia pupils or iris holes. You would have corneal opacities and you would have an angle dysgenesis. And mix and matches of each one of them would give you the conditions that you, that you read about in your textbooks. So these are the various combinations. For instance, a Peters anomaly has a central desmix defect, which comes up on the UBM very well, and iridolenticular or iridocorneal strands. Aniridia usually has a rudimentary iris and foveal aplasia, of course, with angle dysgenesis. So this is a, an OCT in a baby, and you see there's hardly any foveal contour. So if you see nystagmus with aniridia, you should be thinking of a foveal hypoplasia or an aplasia. So this axenfeld riegers anomaly or syndrome, there's polychoria, there's corectopia, there's a posterior embryo toxin. This is actually a detached Schwabe's line, iris processes, and phenotypically a very flat nasal bridge with telecanthus. And then there's a neonatal congenital ectopia in UVA. We'll come to that in a bit. 
where you have very, very se severe iris hypoplasia and the nectropion uvea. We burnt our fingers and thought that we were dealing with some sort of neovascular problem, but we now know better, and it is just one of the angle abnormalities. For Peter's anomaly, a UBM has been invaluable because we need to see the, the uh, Desmet's defect. And in fact, you can see here these huge corneal clefts, which we recognize now, and this is the defect. And then you do surgery, and when it clears, the little defect remains. So it's really the sign qua non of Desmet's or posterior stromal defect. Type 1 is an iridocorneal adhesion. Type 2 is a lenticular adhesion. This is diagrammatically. And this is what, in a baby, you have type 2 in the right eye and type 1 in the left. Now, this is the clue. The clue is a central clearing in the corneal edema. And despite this baby looking so frightening, actually the UBM tells you there is neither an iridal or nor a corneal uh, touch to this. And probably this baby, when you do surgery, is going to land up something like this, requiring just an optical iridectomy and not severe anterior segment reconstruction that this baby would. So the UBM really would, would tell you actually what's going on in the anterior chamber, and we found it very useful. So we talked of axenfeld riga So this is a posterior embryotoxon. This is Riga's anomaly is the iris processes and the corectopia and the polychoria. The syndrome is with systemic manifestations, the characteristic flat nasal bridge, hypodontia, very umbilical redundant skin. Usually they're all in combination. So the one term that you have is an axenfeld Rieger syndrome. You don't really say Axenfeld's anomaly or Rieger's anomaly because usually it's very, very unusual to have them in isolation. Remember it runs in families. If you see a child or a young person, call the family in. This girl came with her father and grandfather. We call them all in. All of them had axenfeld Riga. Similarly, this mother who had no idea that she had it, she only came with a baby. And when we examined her, she had exactly the same thing as this baby had. Aniridia, one of the most intractable glaucomas. I'm very, very scared when I see aniridia. It's autosomal dominant because of PAC6. We'll also talk of genes. Again, runs in families, a father, both sons. The iris, cornea, trabecular meshwork, lens, fovea, and optic nerve. The entire eye structures can be maldeveloped. And we'll understand why, because PAC6 is actually a mother gene. It's sort of a regulator for the PITX2, FOXC1, CYP1B1. It regulates the function of many, many genes for anterior segment development. So when PAC6 is at fault, the entire eye really fails to develop properly. Um, with aniridia, don't ever forget WAGR. Wilkes, aniridia, genitourinary abnormalities and mental retardation, or the Wagger syndrome. And this is the WT1 gene because it's very, very adjacent to the PAC-C1. So if you have a variant there or a mutation there, it is possible that it also goes on to the WT1, which is why you have this syndrome. So this is a novel phenotype that we were, uh, were talking about. We, we were fortunate to be able to publish it this year. It's not been described before. So the underlying variant, I'm not sure. But the few that I've done, I think it is a, it's a, it's a severe variant of the CYP1B1. But it's important to recognize that this is an anterior segment dysgenesis and not neovascular glaucoma as we ourselves thought. So this is ectropion. These vessels that you can see, I don't know how clear they are, but these vessels that you see are because of very, very severe stromal atrophy. And these are normal radial vessels of the iris. And sometimes the hypoplasia is so bad that we have actually miscalled some of them as aniridia, but it's not. It's CEU, it's a neonatal onset, congenital ectropian UV. Congenital primary aphakia is another learning thing that we, it's characterized by absence of lens. So we used to call these things scleropakia, uh, scleroponia, and anterior segment dysgenesis. But we learned our lesson when, again, the UBM taught us that there is absolutely no lens. The cornea is thinned out, and there is no anterior segment structure which is visible. It's aborted lens development, and histologically, there's total aplasia. It's due to homozygous mutations, again, in FOXE3. So these are all homeobox genes which are together responsible for a lot of ocular development. But what we've learned the hard way is recognize the condition. The silvery blue hue on the cornea is very, very important to pick up. No incisional surgery. We've burnt our fingers, and we've learned the hard way. This little boy went into thysis within four weeks of, of doing it, but then of doing surgery. But three years down the line, he's running around in AFK classes. 
IFP reduction we've learned by limited transcleral photocoagulation using trans elimination. So you see how far back the ciliary body really is. AFAK glasses are all that they need. You need genetic testing for Fox E3 because parental counseling is very, very important for them. So why is just knowing the phenotype not enough? So now that I've classified and I understand and I know what to do, because it overlaps so much. So corneal opacity can be in PCG, can be in Peters, can be in aniridia, can be in CPA. Similarly, a corneal opacity with iris adhesions is only in Peters. So all of these features overlap with all these syndromes and you need to just put the bits of the puzzle together and figure out what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about the underlying abnormality. I know all of us run away from genetics, but for developmental glaucoma, it's really simple. So there is greater understanding of the molecular basis in some of these conditions. You must understand maybe part of the disease spectrum. So easy to break it up, Axenfeld, Rieger, Pitex2, and FOXC1. These are the two that are, that are important. Aniridia and Wagger, what we said was PAC6, 11P13. So WT1 and PAC6-1 are both on 11P13, 11 chromosome position 13, which is why both of them at times may have a mutation together which is why you have Wynn's tumor with an iridia. Peter's anomaly could be a result of PAC6, PITEX2, FOXC1, and CYP1V1. All of these are regulatory genes of anterior segment development, all code for transcription factors. Congenital primary aphakia, again, FOXE3. So FOXC1, PAC6, and PITEX2 genes are members of a family called homeobox genes. They're all related together. They're a family. And they are the ones which are involved in the development of the entire anterior segment of the eye. So now you understand why just knowing about these four genes or five genes is enough to explain most of your anterior segment dystensis. So these are the overlying clinical features, like we just said. And these are the, so I, I, if anybody's interested, Snowden has written a lovely paper in I 2017. Just go and read it. The genetic basis of ASD is, is described very well. And where does genetics come in in the clinic? Well, it's a critical first step. You determine and develop gene-based diagnostic and screening tests. Very, very important for families. Now, this family, for instance, they had three daughters. And as in India, they went in for a son. And they did have a fourth son. And I can share with you that the first two had severe glaucoma. The third daughter was given away to a relative for the fourth son. And the fourth son had very severe glaucoma as well. And the third girl is normal. So sometimes you really don't know what, what destiny is playing for you, but it runs in families. And if we, if we had convinced them to do a pedigree and do a genetic thing, we could have told them that your chance of the rest of your children developing glaucoma. So it's not easy to have three PCG children together. And then, of course, there are mixed phenotypes, which nobody knows. So this is Axenfeld in one eye, Peters in the other. This is PCG in one eye, Peters in the other. So it's, it's all a mix and match, and you can have one syndrome in one and one in the other. So it's important to know that. So I'll just spend a bit, um, a minute or so on sturge Bieber because this is easily the most commonly uh, uh, seen systemic anomaly glaucoma. Of course, you can have systemic associations like wounds for aniridae, as we just said, and you can have ventral hernia and aortic valve disease for accidents. So the others are Sturge Weber or Klippel Trinawi. This is what you would have. It's a neurofibromatosis here also and a phacomatosis because you have a melanocyte problem as well. And you can have Lowy syndrome. But this is what so Sturge Weber's glaucoma, remember, comes in two waves. Uh, one is infantile, the babies, and one is the usual young adult or maybe a preteen. Now, the babies usually have a mesodermal distance. So the reason for the glaucoma is not so much raised episcleral venous pressure in a small baby. And that's why sometimes you might have to do surgery for the other eye as well, because the dysgenesis might be in both eyes. Whereas it's the older ones where the raised episcleral venous pressure starts coming into play. So if you have a small baby, you do a gonioscopy, you can see this blood in the Schlem's canal already. So this is a bit of a back pressure here. But the important thing to see is by indirect ophthalmoscopy, look at the glow. And if you see this red glow in one eye, this is this eye, and this normal looking glow in the other, be very careful because this is a choroidal hemangioma. If you're going to miss, don't think you're going to see an orange circumscribed localized mass anywhere in the fundus. That's not the hemangioma that you're going to see in Sturge Weber. 
stretch web is going to be a diffuse choroidal hemangioma. The only thing that will happen is a thickening on ultrasound or maybe an EDOCT if you have. And you'll miss it if you don't look at both eyes at the same time because otherwise this eye looks very, very similar or very normal rather. But this choroidal hemangioma is the one with the leaky endothelial um, and blood interface and they are the ones likely to get into bad choroidal, choroidal detachments. And this is what it looks like on the fundus. So this is the glow. And if you see both funduses together, so where they indirect and switch between them, you can see how red this is and how normal this is. And this, this difference is what you have to appreciate. This is, of course, the episcleral um, <clears throat> hemangiomas here as well. This is just before surgery. And post-op, we've started giving them propranolol. So you can, you can read that paper in ophthalmology glaucoma. And uh, they do well with that. So in India, don't forget infections. And I'm very happy that rubella has been included in non-acquired, even though it's a viral infection. And why it's, that happens is the viropathy in the trabecular meshwa causes a developmental arrest. So if you understand that, that at the end of the day, it is a developmental problem. It could be genetics, but it could be viral induced. And this monkey baby is what you should recognize as rubella. Um, if you do a UBM, you'll see a typical zonular cataract with this corneal edema. And under the microscope, you can actually make out the cataract. So rubella is a possibility in congenital glaucoma, and we shouldn't forget that. So I'd like to share this. This is actually part of the Indian Pediatric Glaucoma uh, Incident Study, where uh, a group of us got together, and we decided to look at new childhood glaucomas that came to us from 1st January to 31st December 2019 in one year. We are collating them and we'll soon get the results out. But I can share our centers that out of 341 new glaucomas that we saw in one year, 277 of them were glaucoma suspects. So I didn't take them. 618 children were referred for glaucoma. So out of the 341, we had 41.6% PCG and 16% the non-acquired ones that I've talked about, which makes it about 55% of non-acquired. So developmental glaucoma really is more than half the chunk. But in a referral center like ours, 42% are acquired. And out of them, a lot is steroid and a lot is trauma. So we need to keep that in mind that we do have a lot of acquired childhood glaucomas also coming in. So a bit about the UBM, the ultrasound biomicroscopy has really changed the way we look at childhood glaucoma. It has helped our understanding so much and one of the best things that we've had is had one dedicated UBM in the OT for our babies. So this is the Quantel, uh, no financial uh, interest, of course, but it is uh, one of the finest uh, 50 megahertz ultra, uh, UBM available. Uh, this has a soft sleeve. So when you put that in, even in a newborn baby, it doesn't matter the, what the cup size is. You don't need to bother about it because it's a soft cup. And it just molds into whatever your palpable aperture is. And this is how the UBM is, is done. And I acknowledge Deepika for making that video for me. Um, it's helped us immensely in aiding clinical decisions. So Peter's in both eyes. You can see that this one is relatively all right. And this year already there's a cataract and the iris is going in. So I wouldn't want to touch this eye too early. But this one, all she needs is an optical iridectomy. She's going to school now with 624 vision. And I hope that we can... Uh, tied over whatever uh, we can with this. So uh, a bit about the surgery. I know uh, Dr. Mandal sir has just gone through a CTT yesterday, so we did not go too much into that. Um, how do you decide? So the initial surgery varies, frankly, with the corneal clarity. And uh, in a PCG or a developmental glaucoma where it's a new dysgenesis, it makes sense to just slice the trabecular meshwork and provide a conduit from the aqueous out into the collector channel. So this is what we do. If we can't see it, of course, we do a combined trap and trap. Acquired glaucomas usually require a trap with NMC. So this is the principle. It's ab interno. There's a direct gonial lens. You put in whatever knife. We use MDRs. We use 26 gauge or 25 gauge needles through a surgical gonial lens, slice it, and we provide a conduit. So these are the various lenses uh, available. I like this one, Jacob, the best for the resolution, but whatever you're comfortable with, one can use. Uh, I've shown you this picture before. The microscope needs to be tilted a little bit, and the head of the child needs to be tilted so that the angle is where the light is going to enter your eye. So this is just a very short clip of a goniotomy. This is axenfeld Riga. So I, I fished out a, a developmental anomaly to show that. And these are the, the typical Y-shaped 
So you can see the cleft that is forming. Can you see that? So this, this iris just goes back, it recedes because it's a high insertion and this is the cleft which is formed, which is what will be the conduit for the aqueous to go out into the thing. So this is all that I like the procedure very much because I don't have to open conjunctiva, I don't have to make a scleral flap, it's ab internal and our early journey is very encouraging. So uh, this, this kid just needed one goniotomy in both eyes, she's about almost five now, this is an earlier picture. This infantile PCG, you can do two of them. So this one required two. So you can see she was absolutely hazy. And then we did one and then realized she needed another. And now she's all right with two. So sometimes you can do two. Nowadays, you can do a goniotomy, uh, gonioscopy assisted TTT as well. This is just, uh, this is one of those uh, neonatal uh, congenital ectropion UVA. So um, I don't think I need to show this after Dr. Mandel's video yesterday but uh, just to show you that it's it's absolutely white so the congenital ectropion uva that's that's a story for another day which we'll talk about but uh, it doesn't matter if you have a white cornea then obviously you can't do a goniotomy and you just open up the schlems and then move in and uh, do your combined arbitrarily so uh, it's extremely gratifying things like this so uh, this is a nice picture, so I'm just sharing that. This is a half ray which has stretched. So when it really stretches, this is what happens. And this is one of the most gratifying ones because the mother comes in one day. So she, the child is like normal. Then one fine day becomes white and she comes rushing to you in the emergency. And you're like, oh, this is something which I think will be all right. And one of those which you can tell the mother, nee, nee, don't worry, it's okay. And sure enough, yeah, within two months, it's yeah, okay. So he's, he's, that's good. Neonatal onset glaucomas, you're very scared of. This is one of the earliest that we had, came to us at 16 hours because she was born at PGI. At night, she came to us in the morning and she's a naughty three-year-old now, but she's good. Um, the, a bit about how early it can develop. Don't think that preterms have only ROP. Preterms can have glaucoma as well. And it just happens that they were born early. So if they have a trabecular dysgenesis, whether they are born at 40 weeks and come to you or they're born at 28 weeks, it's still there. So this 25 weeker, 780 grams came to us. And uh, we had temporal avascular retina, which regressed with time. We don't wait anymore if we have GA and our, our general anesthesia is okay and the child is otherwise okay, healthy. So even a goniotomy, now at six months of age is actually just about a month after the child was supposed to have been born and the corneas do clear. So goniotomies work in preterms as well. A word of caution, sometimes no glaucoma treatment is required and you need to know that every white cornea is not glaucoma. So this is a congenital primary aphakia, which we call sclerocornea. If you're going to do glaucoma surgery for this, you're in trouble. Every bufthalmos is not glaucoma requiring glaucoma surgery. This is secondary bufthalmos due to retinoblastoma. Look at the child properly. Every proptosed eye is not bufthalmos. This is cruzons because of a shallow orbit. Again, referred to us for glaucoma. And every pale disc is not glaucomatous. This is hydrocephalus with a shunt. And it is pale because of a neurological problem. So every white is not. So these are all which are referred to us for glaucoma surgery, but they didn't have glaucoma. And just to finish it, even if the IOP is controlled, the cornea is clear, and the disc is healthy. Is our job done? So this boy operated at nine months, lost to follow up and came to us four years later. And now he has a, a myopia of 21 diopters in one eye. So what do you do? You say it is fine. The best character vision is 660 and the pressure is fine and the disc is fine. No, you don't. You do something. And what do you do? So we weighed our, our options and actually did a clear lens extraction. Dr. Veratram did a clear lens extraction with a minus four diopter lens. And now he's 612 with bifocals with an active patching in the left eye. But we are scared. And someday we'll show that that we've done another child and we put a, 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 a large-sized ICL because we didn't want to take out the clear lens in such a small boy as well. So to summarize, childhood glaucoma is a lifelong disease, as all glaucomas are, except that the life of a child is so much longer than the rest of the glaucoma. And it can manifest in myriad forms. We've seen that, multiple etiologies. So much is yet unknown. And ensuring vision is our goal, not IOP control. So there's so much more to go along with it. We need to hold these children's hands for a long, long time. And I love this quote. Uh, thank you to all my residents who worked so painstakingly day and night to help me put these things together. But the question is not whether we can afford to invest in every child. 
The question is whether we can afford not to. So I love that. Thank you so much. It's been such a lovely thing to be sharing my work. Thank you. Thank you, Sushmita. That was really wonderful. You know, in a nutshell, you have covered a really huge topic and you've made it simple enough for, you know, anyone and everyone to understand. Thank, Thank you so much. At this point, I invite both Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pratik for their uh, 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 comments. And then uh, maybe we can take some questions. So I think extremely amazing. I think even I learned the way she taught how the anger develops and everything so uh, beautifully and uh, diagrammatically. So I think uh, she's a master and uh, that's what she has shown <laughs> so beautifully. I think I really don't have anything much to add to that. Uh, Prateep, please. Yes, Rishwita, wonderful talk. Congratulations. Uh, as her said, yes, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> Too many things to learn. Yes, so much, so much. Yes. <laughs> we learn every day, sir. Google Baba is on our phones. <laughs> Especially every the syndrome. Oh, my God. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. How many goniotomies do we do? How many, sir? Uh, goniotomies. Yeah, my first is a goniotomy, sir. I mean, uh, maybe about 70, 75, uh, 70 a year easily. Yeah. My first would always be a goniotomy. Surprisingly, once we put them under the microscope, what we think are even that child that I showed, we start off thinking is ka CTT karna padega. But if you see the angle and it, it does work, I mean, especially in the infantile glaucomas, I'll be happier doing two goniotomies than opening a conjunctiva and cutting up sclera in a baby now. <laughs> it's much easier. But. I'm really glad you say that because you see, at the end of the day, uh, we need to go with the least invasive, I feel. And, you know, if required, we can go uh, towards surgeries which are not conjunctiva sparing. But I think conjunctiva sparing is, is the way to go, especially if you can see the angle. Actually, I've even tried it with an endoscope and it's not that difficult. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, however, you you know uh, obviously it requires a little bit of coordination and things like that. But let's start from the very beginning. For where EUAs are concerned, what what is your choice uh, for? Okay, for so kids? Uh, so when we start off with, of course, it's full general anesthesia because uh, an EUA takes about twice as long as the surgery itself. So we have once we have the baby under anesthesia, I go whole hog. So it starts with of course, the corneal diameters, pachymetry. Of course, the pressure, the first thing before the intubation is done, the minute they, the anesthetist gives me, I like to take uh, Perkins pressures because come what may, the eye care pressures somehow are not particularly uh, reliable in these weird corneas. I think the biomechanics are all haywire. So whatever the pressure is, I take it, take it as that. And then the corneal diameter, the pachymetry, Gonioscopy, if I can see disc pictures, we, gonios we take the pictures. I don't have a fundus camera in the OT, so we take the pictures if we can through the gonio lens. And if the cornea is hazy, a UBM in every one of them and an axial length in every one of them. So all this takes up more time than the surgery itself, but it gives me much more information. Surgery, I think, is easy. I mean, once, once I know what to do and we characterize it. So we've now learned that Congenital ectropion uvea, for instance, no matter how clear the angle is, it's an intractable glaucoma, which is not going to work with this for some strange reason. Maybe the collector channels are simply not formed. So I go in straight and do a combined trap with trap. So okay. we've learned that the hard way. A Sturge Weber, I started doing a goniotomy and not opening up a combined trap with trap because it's a closed chamber technique. It's dysgenesis in a small baby. If I cut open trabecular meshwork, usually they do well. I've learned to not look at pressures in the other eye, but look at the angle and intervene early. And COVID has taught us that. COVID has taught us that there's no point in the child coming back six months later with a half stride. I mean, if yeah. you see this genesis in one eye and you see a disc which is suspicious, more than 0.3, don't say that the pressure is 10 so it doesn't have glaucoma. Just go in and do it while it is on the table. Right. So then, uh, sorry. 
Yeah. Sorry. I'm curious, then what, how do you counsel the parents? Do you tell them that we're going to do this EUA and then uh, we, yes. if it's required, we'll yes. go ahead with surgery? Yes, yes. I okay. tell them that, look, this eye pakka requires surgery. This eye looks all right to me, but Behoshi Karti, if I feel that this requires surgery for glaucoma, I'll do it now. Then have you come back and go through this COVID. And they're very happy with that because fear will COVID hoga. GPSE hoga so they say okay okay you do it in this nothing okay. so, well that is I mean this is this is COVID but you know generally speaking also COVID has COVID has taught me to do bilateral uh, surgery on the same day I wouldn't be doing it I'd be very very scared to okay. do it before but this time it has taught us and I think follow-ups are so much easier refractions are easier amblyopia treatment is easier yeah. everything is easier in a small baby if both eyes have to be done together Medical, the management is easy. Isme char bar, isme do bar, isme che bar, isme ek bar. It is horrible. So, so it's yeah. very good. Both eyes six times. Both eyes do that. Right, right. So to what age you do bilateral? Okay. So whenever required. Yes. Whenever any required, age. Any age. If required, I would do bilateral. Any age. And when would you do the perimetry? At what age? So the we've got a thesis, sir. Uh, Uman, she will be presenting at the WGC. So interestingly, uh, they start at at five or six. So because we don't they, have the normative data. No, we don't. The normative data is well, actually, actually in children, the mean deviation is less than the normative data. And what we did was we looked at adults with the same RNFL thickness, and the norm the the mean deviation of those children were lesser. So we don't do it. We don't compare it to normative data. We just do the field and take it as it is and then follow up the child until they come to age 18. Yeah, it does like, make like sense. We do the, like we do the OCD. I mean, in children, we don't compare it to the normative database. We just take its thickness values and we compare it for the same child. So at least for the same child, I have some idea. But the interesting thing when we looked at it over time, sir, is that because the retinal sensitivity is getting better, the feels in a child with glaucoma gets better. So that, that's the only problem I have, that how the hell am I going to figure out progression? Because his innate sensitivity is better till age 12. And this was shown by more fields by Dr. John Brooks. So they have the optic study, and they've shown that it increases till about 12 years and then flattens out, and then the normative thing happens at about 18. Have you ever noticed the spontaneous resolution of the uh, pediatric glaucoma? <laughs> no, sir. I mean, I've seen reports of it, but I, or maybe let's put it the other way, I've never had a baby untreated to see if it spontaneously resolves. But the converse, I've not seen an adult with, with signs of uh, glaucoma, but uh, no signs. So the trabecular dysgenesis, the trabecular maturity develops and then they could starts the result. And I have seen a couple of the patient, you know, mm -hmm. uh, could not do the surgery and then uh, okay. over a period of time, the pressure came down and the cornea became clear and then... Achha. Okay. No, 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 obviously, yes, I read the reports as well. I read reports of adults with, say, half strike, but normal disc and fields. So those spontaneously resolved ECGs, there are reports. I'm sure it must be happening because the angle is developing. Mm -hmm. So uh, so maybe it just develops and you know somehow pushes it out. Shushmita, in pseudophakia with secondary glaucomas, what is your approach? Pseudophakia with secondary glaucoma, sir, depends on the glaucoma. I would do a trap with trap or I would put in a tube depending on how severe it is. Because, and it depending on what pseudophakia also, if there's a large corneal scar, I mean, a conjunctival scar, and uh, I would think trap would not work, I would not hesitate in putting in a tube because pseudophakia, it's easy. I can put it in the sulcus and just have it protruding out a little bit, peeking into the pupillary area. And that's it. Children, sir, I'm very scared of the cornea because they do rub. And as my hair is getting grayer, I am getting like, Everybody else was ki mud dal. Don't put a tube in the yeah, def definitely in, uh, more, you know, more trouble, more trouble. Sir, also I've started doing a lot of this again. Maybe COVID, I don't know. Not going in. I've started doing a lot of limited uh, TSCPC with trans elimination. 
it yeah, works. That's what a lot of nice. people are going in for. Yeah. Now. So 180 degrees with transillumination in a Even child. Even was saying that, and I thought they are very cleverly not trying to do the harder part, but it seems that <laughs> that is yeah, the trend because, now. Yes, because it, it's I think over a period we've all become less aggressive as we are going yes. <laughs> surgically. Yeah. Micro pulse works. So we had the, again, nothing financial. We had the quantil. We weren't particularly happy with that. Dr. Pandav had a couple of... Even in pediatric patients? Yeah. yeah, in pediatric, he had an RD. And yeah, because I think even Dr. Das and Dr. Tanoj and all, they have almost the same experience. Yeah. I think in pediatrics, sir, the main problem is that it rubs the parsplena area. So we don't know where that is. Maybe it is stretched. So maybe the peripheral retinal thing happened because of that. So... Maybe in a stretch tie, then you're, you know, pressing on the pass plane and doing whatever. I mean, it didn't work then, then COVID happened. So we haven't had a demo <laughs> machine with the, I think biomedics wanted to sell us to have the demo machine. We didn't have it. So someday we will. We have the advantage of saying uh, demo. Uh, <laughs> there is a question here, which yes, yes. says, sure. I mean, we've already had a little bit of a discussion. Okay. Is there any possibility that a surgical treatment might arrest the glaucoma in PCG? Prime, I mean, it's primary congenital glaucoma, sorry. Surgical treatment of the glaucoma will arrest the glaucoma? I mean, I, that's why we are doing it. We hope <laughs> that happens. I, I, I didn't get the I suppose they're trying to say that, you know, you, you cure the disease rather than control. <laughs> you know, glaucoma I, I, I wish. is control. I, yeah, I wish. We should understand I that. Yeah. I didn't put this up. I thought it would be too much, but uh, uh, at least the APGS may, I think I have that post-op management. Maybe I should have done that. We do axial lengths. And uh -huh. we've learned we've learned to plot it on San Paolo's normative database. Every file of ours has an axial length growth right. chart, like a growth curve, and every visit is plotted. And if it is going beyond, so believe me, we've had children with 12 pressures who we have done a second goniotomy because the axial length plot is going up. The bara pressure to hai, but the eye is growing; it's elastic. So the axial length is something which we miss. And myopic shift, same thing. If the axial length is going to increase, the myopia is going to increase as well. It's just that myopia has so many more variables. There's cornea. So the yeah. cornea flattens and the myopia doesn't, doesn't show up. Even so, the lens can go back. Yes, the lens goes back. It goes flat. The cornea flattens. So myopia didn't show up. We used to do a lot of serial my, uh, the refraction. And then I realized the axial length is very, very good. So axial length is like sacrosanct now. The axial length is okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, actually speaking, uh, since I have, uh, you know, uh, joined CFS, I, un, until and unless I've done a, a B scan and an axial length, I actually don't even take the patient for, uh, you know, for an EUA, don't suggest anything because you, you do have to have quite uh, you know a degree of suspicion uh, before before uh, any any such action if um, you know we don't have any further questions uh, if uh, uh, the chair and co-chair also do not then i think we can say you know say thank you to sushmita for yeah, a no, wonderful no, wonderful pleasure. talk thank you for we really enjoyed it uh, and hope to see you soon somewhere Sure. Uh, my pleasure to talk about my babies anyway. <laughs> if I can go on and on. So, uh, yeah. At this point, what we do is when we have a little time, we quiz our hot seaters okay. uh, with some uh, extra questions. You're welcome to stay with us or yes, yes. if you want to leave, no problem. I was uh, um, asking them about uh, a differential diagnosis of um, uh, just a minute, yeah, of uh, an eye which looks like that uh, or eyes that look like that. Let me share my screen. So I hope they're still around. Uh, Tanmay, we, I was questioning you the other day and we couldn't uh, finish. You talked about proptosis and I said, proptosis is generally not a word you use. 
in children you do say enlarge globe and at uh, birth maybe you you can't make that out uh, but buphthalmos is the word that is used can may you there yes ma'am yes yeah Okay, yes. so uh, I think uh, between Dr. Mandal and Dr. Uh, Sushmita, you now have uh, uh, quite a bit of idea uh, what your differential would be in a case like this. Mind you, remember this is bilateral, you know, unilateral would be a, a different uh, set of differentials. Would you like to elaborate? Hello? Dr. Tanmay, would you like to answer yes. that, please? Yeah. Yes. Um, Ma'am, in uh, uh, this kind of presentation in bilateral eyes, uh, this can be primary congenital glaucoma. This can be uh, Axenfeld uh, Rieger syndrome. Uh, this can okay. be uh, Peters also. Uh, and Peters is more commonly unilateral, but it can be. And uh, any... Uh, sclerocornea, but in sclerocornea, the limbus uh, will be also hazy. And okay. mm -hmm. in. Uh, so, do you have limbus to limbus uh, corneal edema here? Or, uh, you know, this is a I... limbus sparing, ma'am. Okay. So, if you have limbus to limbus, is there a particular uh, differential that you think about? Ma'am, in limbus to limbus, it's. Uh, uh, in anterior segment, uh, TAS, TAS ma'am, limbus to limbus edema mm, is there, is but a not in surgical. Yes, uh, post surgical. Yeah. In congenital so, cases, ma'am, uh, if there is desmet membrane uh, defect or. Well, okay. Uh, you can get birth trauma. Generally, birth trauma is unilateral, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it can be bilateral, nobody is stopping it, but generally speaking, it is uh, unilateral. Uh, one very important differential with bilateral white cornea. Congenital rubella, it can be. Okay. And... Ma'am, endothelial dystrophies. Yes, yes. which one? Congenital head Congenital. endothelial dystrophy. Yes, very, very important. So then when you are going through your examination under anesthesia, uh, you know, in the uh, OPD, the minimum you need to do is, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, at least what I would do is do a, a, a digital um, uh, check digitally whether the eye, eye looks, you know, eye is soft or, you know, borderline or does it appear hard. And if I can't see anything else, you know, you can't see anything in the anterior segment, then one very important investigation that is required is the B scan. We've talked about that in the previous lecture also, that a B scan not only gives you an idea whether there is any intraocular pathology and you have to always, always remember that you know you could have a retinoblastoma you could have you could have so many other things so a, a b scan is very important and b scan is important from the point of view of checking for its axial yes Excellent. yes and so that is why you need to know what is the uh, general axial and this is this is a baby which is you know just born so how much would you expect in this child Unless you know what the normal is at that age, what the normative is at that age, you wouldn't know whether it's, you know, what you're dealing with is an abnormality or not, isn't it? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. So what is it? Around 16. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what is I'm it? Around 16 to 18 will. Yeah, exactly. Would you agree with that, Sushmita, or do you think it's, it's longer? Uh, axial length, yeah, it's yeah. usually it should be around se 17 at birth is normal, mm -hmm. but uh, usually somebody like this boy would be or this baby would be about 18 19 with bulging bone. Yes, length. that's correct. Yeah, one eye was 19, one eye was 18. Um, so, um, I'll just briefly show you now. This is four weeks post uh, combined trab and trab. There's no way a goniotomy could have been done in this baby. Um, uh, although the corneal edema appeared limbus sparing, 
you can see it is starting to clear. So I, uh, one question, one burning question is, you know, how long do you wait for corneal edema to clear, Sushmita? Well, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know whether there's a time period, but I do know that as soon as possible, within, uh, I would wait about six months before I would start thinking of uh, a peripheral iridectomy. Um, mm -hmm. LB Prasad is lucky to have Murli. Most institutes don't have him. And uh, they're very, uh, very... For a, for a peripheral iridectomy, you said? Peripheral iridectomy. I would do an optical iridectomy optical. by six months, eight months. Because uh -huh. uh, they become so densely amblyopic later. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. usually if it has to clear, it would clear by six, seven months at the most. Yeah. But if it's not clearing beyond that, you can think that it's becoming a scar, mm -hmm. which is probably not going to clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, optical iridectomies have worked very well. You give them vision and they can wait for their PKs whenever it happens. But right, right, right. That's a work. great tip. It's certainly a great trip. tip. Okay. So the next question, this was actually meant for last week and we couldn't complete it uh, in Dr. Mandel's um, <laughs> lecture. Uh, not this one, sorry. Mm, shall we go ahead? Yeah. So let me give you a brief history about this, uh, this patient. He is, and now we've gone to adults. Sorry, Sushmita. 44 year old, he's mildly myopic, no family history of glaucoma and is on four drugs. Uh, at that time, we didn't have, uh, you know, and I'm talking about 10 years ago now, didn't have uh, the newer generation uh, rho kinase uh, inhibitors and uh, CCT was average. And this is what the disc looked like. And I want one volunteer, let me see who else is there. Uh, Dr. Ajiba, are you there? Or have you left us? I don't think she's there. Sony, Dr. Sony? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Would you like to, to take, uh, describe that disc for me? Please remember, I want those five points first, how you describe. What were those five, five points? Uh, as the lectures proceed, Move forward doesn't mean you forget what has been taught. That is so important. To be able to recognize normal from abnormal. Normal shape, size, uh, neuroretinal rim. Wait, size you can't say unless you have another disc in comparison. Okay? Okay? So you just say, I will talk about the size and I will compare it if if the other disc is available okay. but okay it is definitely not a large disc this much i can tell you yeah by just by the appearance of it okay. yes yeah. okay uh, then this is a normal looking disc uh, with cup disc ratio don't start by saying normal looking disc how do you know it's normal before you qualitatively talked about those uh, four features what are those four features other than the size, you have four features, isn't it? Neuroretinal rim, you have retinal nerve fiber layer, you look for hemorrhages, you look for peripapillary atrophy. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Okay. So now you talk about that. Um, you had to get into the habit of talking about all of this. You know, you will not get a clear cut, you know, uh, laminar dot sign and overpass cupping and all those things in all this. So you have to fall back on these features to give you, believe me, those kind of features may be nonspecific or, you know, maybe the glaucoma is too advanced. But you have to be able to pick up glaucoma, which is not advanced. So what can you say? Uh, the cup disc ratio is 0.4 to 0.5. I didn't even talk about the cup disc ratio, did I? I asked you about the neuroretinal rim. Uh, neuroretinal rim uh, looks healthy, obeying ISNT rule. Uh, there are no uh, hemorrhages. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no peripapillary atrophy. Okay. Uh, there are no nerve fiber layer defects. Okay. I don't agree with you. 
Is there anyone else who does not agree? Okay, fine. I, you know, compass ratio really is a quantification that you can do, but uh, unless you pick up the qualitative features, it really does not mean much. This is, this is something we're trying to tell you again and again. So would you like to have a closer look at this disc for me, please? Oh, hmm? Do you see any difference in the pattern and the color, inferior versus superior? Yes, ma'am. The inferior, uh, the superior part is more transparent. Superior part looks um, blood vessels look are more revealing. Yes, they look darker, don't they? Yes, more better. So, who was it who told me there was no nerve fiber layer defect? Myself, ma'am. Ah, see how you picked it up now? Yes. You're not looking at the correct place. Even inferiorly, I can see one. Can you see one coming up here? Yes, ma'am. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Maybe obscured by this blood vessel I may not mean anything, but in, in, an, in an eye where I'm seeing diffuse loss superiorly compared to inferior. Can you see the pattern here? You can possibly uh, appreciate the pattern maybe better in a uh, red free. Can you see the pattern here? Yeah? Yes. Sir. Inferiorly? and no pattern superiorly. It is a little tessellated background, there is no doubt, but you can still pick up those signs. So what is, what is the whole point? You said, isn't rule is obeyed? Yes, perhaps it is, but it's give, showing me so much superior, no fiber layer Thank defect. Yes. Yeah. So don't just go by one, one qualitative feature, you have to look at all the qualitative features. So uh, who said it was normal? Started by saying it was normal? Is it normal now? No, ma'am. Huh? No, ma'am, it's not normal. Are you convinced or not? Yes, ma'am. That is more important. Huh? Yes, ma'am, I'm convinced. Ma you're convinced it's normal? No, ma'am. No, you're convinced it's, it's abnormal. abnormal. Yes, this, this, uh, he, this patient, he had an inferior, quite, dense visual field defect and that those kind of defects are the most debilitating why why are inferior defects more uh, symptomatic for patients because they interfere with your reading when you're looking down they interfere with with uh, you know your maybe uh, climbing up a step stairs okay yeah you understand yeah. so this this is a, uh, way more debilitating, uh, a superior defect uh, in glaucoma, generally speaking, inferior is which is affected first. Yeah, generally speaking, but it could be superior. When it's superior, it's way more debilitating vis where, where the visual function is concerned rather than when it's inferior. When it's inferior, you uh, tend to get a superior defect, which does not seem to be that much symptomatic as this would be okay. okay i i think we will stop there if you if you guys have any questions if you have still have doubts so see here it does not matter this was actually a small size disc i deliberately did not show you the uh, other disc because you need to start assessing uh, just by looking at a disc okay whether it is this this cannot be large this is either small or it's average size that's one b you look at the five features other than size, which I said that if you don't have the other uh, disc, it's slightly difficult to talk about. So neuroretinal rim isn't rule. We feel superior is less than inferior, which is generally what uh, isn't rule is all about. Yet, look at the nerve fiber layer. There is such an advanced change superiorly. Okay, you remember there was a disc that uh, Dr. Sirisha showed where they did not pick it up on, on examination, they did not pick it up on photographs, but when they did um, did the OCT and saw the, uh, uh, the RNFL change, then they went back 
to look at the photographs and the discs and they found it. Yeah. So these things can be missed if you do not look at a disc qualitatively. And when I say qualitatively, I mean, look at the rim, no fiber, no fiber layer. The what disc size, okay, size. peripapillary atrophy, hemorrhages. Hemorrhages, yes. Okay, so I think we can call it a day now. <laughs> Thank you very much. But we'll show you that many more so that, you know, when you, when you, um, sorry, I want to stop share now. Uh, yeah. So when, when we, um, the more we look, the more, the more we, we can make out pathology from no pathology. Okay, so don't be biased. You look at a disc, I know everyone starts by saying, oh, this is CD ratio, so such and such. You come to CD ratio the last, don't come first. Second, talk about, don't, don't talk about whether it's normal or abnormal. Come to your diagnosis, whether it's normal or abnormal, only after you've talked about these qualitative features. When you look, when you count down these features, that's when you're looking at those features and that's where you may pick up those features. Okay? Bye-bye now. Enough for today. Yes, Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> right? uh, next week, uh, Thank you, Wednesday, Thank you. We, we have, you're most welcome. We have Dr. Lingam Vijay, another master in glaucoma on pseudo exfoliation. Okay?